<laughs> um, will be a quick recap of some of the things that we covered on day one. Um, but just for your knowledge, and so you know, as you just heard, we record all of our trainings. So once um, today's training is over, we'll go in um, and upload both day one on Tuesday and today's training onto our YouTube channel. So if you missed anything or if you have to leave early, um, no worries, you're welcome to visit our website and check out the recordings and see what you might have missed. Um, so welcome, welcome. We're very excited to have you here today. And we're going to get ourselves started. We're going to jump right in. So I'm going to ask um, Tanayo to get us to our next slide. Um, and very quickly, similarly to day one, just wanted to do a quick overview of some of the Zoom buttons that we're going to be using um, throughout the course of this training on day two. So you might be familiar with those two buttons on the left-hand corner of your screen, your mute and video button. Um, as always, we love to see your face. Um, so if you can share video, um, we welcome it, but if for some reason you cannot or need to step away, feel free to do what you need to do to take care of yourself. Um, if you are seeing my screen and your slides, then that means you are probably on speaker view. And if you go to the top right hand corner, you can switch to gallery view and see more than just my face, if that's what you prefer. Um, I don't believe we're going to be using annotate today. We did use that on day one. So check out the recording if you want to learn more about how to use that button. Um, or that feature, excuse me. And then we'll be certainly using the chat button, which um, a lot of you have already sort of taken advantage of. And it's just an another opportunity for you to engage, ask questions, make comments, share resources, whatever comes up throughout the day, please feel free to drop it in the chat box. And of course, as always, please feel free to unmute yourself and bring your voice into this space as well. So that's our quick Zoom overview. I'm going to go to the next slide. Um, again, this is just a quick instruction slide. I won't review this now, but we will be going into breakout rooms actually very shortly. We're going to do one um, similarly to day one right at the top to do some welcome and introductions. Um, you'll be assigned to a room with a few other folks, and we're going to give you a question for you all to think about. Um, but like we did on day one, we uh, like to make these uh, introductory breakout rooms optional. So if you choose not to go in and, and chat with folks and answer the question, you're welcome to hang out in the main room if that's what you choose to do. One thing that we didn't say explicitly, I think, on day one um, about the breakout rooms when we do them. So this one is more of an introductory, like a chance to warm up your voice, get to know some other folks that are attending this training, maybe learn a little bit about what they're doing. Um, and then when we get into breakout rooms later on in the day through the content stuff, that's when we're really kind of digging into some of the challenges that came up in day one, some of the tools and frameworks that we are going to introduce throughout this training. Um, so as always, those, again, those are going to be optional. So if you choose to hang out in the main room because you've got other stuff to do, or you're not ready to collaborate or to um, participate in those conversations, that's totally fine. But just know that there's, you know, there's an element of the training that you're missing if you choose not to be a part of those breakout rooms. So just FYI, I want to make sure that um, folks are kind of aware of that as we move forward. Um, and I think that's all I wanted to say about breakout rooms. So I think we're going to go to our next slide. Um, again, if you are having bandwidth or audio issues, you can change over to your phone audio on Zoom. And you do that by clicking the little arrow button next to your mute button. And then you go to switch to phone audio and you can connect your video and audio using the little participant ID or pin um, that you see right there on your screen. And if you have any questions about how that happens, um, please feel free to chat Jasper in the chat box. Jasper is gonna be helping us with all things tech today. Um, so they'll be happy to walk you through that. Next slide, please. And these are our learning objectives. We went over them on day one. And again, they're the same for day two. So today we're really going to get into this um, practicing facilitation skills. Um, again, we're going to continue learning some uh, practices, best practices, promising practices, which is things that we're still trying to figure out. They make sense in the moment and get into those challenges that you all mentioned on day one. So fingers crossed, at the end of today's training, we will have our full feedback form. Well, you'll get a chance to give us feedback on, did we achieve these learning objectives? Do you feel like 
um, we got to what we needed to get to in these in these two training days, um, or one if you only attended one. Um, so please stick around and please fill that out. We use that information to inform future trainings and future calendars for the, the years coming. Like what are folks into? What do people really like? Do you have any suggestions for other trainings that you want to see from, from us? So stick around and you get a chance to, to give us some more information about what you thought, how we did today. Next slide, please. All right, so this is our agenda for today. We are uh, in the middle of kind of doing some welcome and introductions, giving you a rundown of what we hope to accomplish today. As I mentioned, we're gonna be revisiting some of the challenges that were brought up in day one. Tanayo and I sat down yesterday and really tried to come up with some like themes or buckets that all your challenges kind of fit into to make the brainstorming solutions part of today. Um, a little bit more concise, like what are ways that really we can really get to some of the strategies to help address those challenges that you all came up with in a more, um, I can't think of the word that I'm trying to say, but to help kind of channel sort of what our thoughts and strategies are to think through the themes um, for those challenges. And then we're going to do a little bit of practicing. What does that actually look like in the moment? How are you going to deal with or practice dealing with difficult scenarios that come up when you're facilitating online or hybrid meetings, what could that look like? And what would you do in the moment given this scenario? So it is a little bit of role playing, a little bit of practicing, um, and that's gonna happen through uh, towards the end of today as well through breakout rooms too. And then we'll close out. And like I said, we're gonna do the feedback form and all kinds of wonderful stuff at the end um, as well and have a chance to answer any lingering questions or things that come up. Um, for you all as we wrap up the day. So I'm going to ask us to move to the next slide, which I believe is our agreements. Yes. So these are the agreements that we all chose to agree to um, on day one, and I wanted to re-highlight them here on day two. Um, so as mentioned, you, if you can, please leave your camera on. We love to see your face. Um, mute yourself if you're not speaking to reduce background noise. One thing I want to say about this one um, in particular that I want to call out to that I was thinking about earlier today is that one of the things that we notice as folks were talking about challenges is this idea of engagement. Like how do you engage folks that are online or, or what does this look like across platforms? And depending on your meeting and depending on your group, we do this for groups like this where we ask folks to mute themselves because there's a good number of you, right? There's 40 participants in the room and that could potentially be a lot of background noise depending on where you are, especially if you're in a shared space. But Internally, when we have smaller meetings and we really want to hear folks and we want the conversation to flow, we ask people to stay unmuted. As long as they don't have any crazy background noise, that way we find that it's easier for folks to kind of, you know, jump into the conversation without like the fear of like, I'm going to press a mute. Oh, that person's talking. Oh, I'm going to talk over them where we're all kind of on unmute as if kind of simulating we were all kind of in the room together. Um, so just wanted to name that that's a promising practice that we use for smaller meetings or for team meetings that we find it's really helpful to um, just stay off of mute. It allows folks to kind of speak more freely and not hide behind their mute button, which, you know, <laughs> happens when you're in online meetings. So just wanted to name that as well for folks um, as you're thinking through what this could look like for your own groups. Um, we use this idea of taking space and making space to really kind of notice how you are bringing your voice and your presence and your experience and your expertise into the room. So taking the space to do so, um, and, and we welcome that and also making space for others who do that as well. Um, respecting others and yourself in this space and taking care of yourself is also really important. So these are our five or so group agreements. Um, and I want to pose this question to the group. Now that we're here on day two, um, and we're going to jump into content in a second, what group agreement do you think we did really well on day one? Like, what do you think worked really well for us as a group as we think back to day one? I'd say respecting each other. Yeah, tell me more, Cheryl. What do you think? How do we do that well? Between the chat and giving people the opportunity to speak, 
um, in the break rooms. I, I just thought it was really well handled. Mm. Thank you. I appreciate that. And I agree with you. And then I hear, I see on the chat as well, Jill saying folks kept their cameras on. Yeah, it was wonderful to see folks engaging across laughing um, and enjoying themselves. Um, I got a kick out of all the animals that folks were <laughs> embodying on day one. So hopefully we can bring that same energy and um, laughter as we move into day two. Yeah. The, and uh, Sherry is saying, I thought the small group discussions were a good space to hear from others. Wonderful. Thank you all so much. Is there any one of these group agreements we think we could probably do a better job? Is there something that you're like, hmm, I think we could probably step it up a notch as a group? What do we think? Jill saying no. <laughs> Jennifer saying no. <laughs> Thumbs up. All right. All right, sounds good. If there's anything that comes to mind, please feel free to jump in there. But we always wanna sort of call back to our group agreements because this is how we agree to hold space together. We wanna to make sure that we're paying attention to it and that's not something that you throw on your wall or throw on your PowerPoint and never think about again. Um, so it's always nice to kind of revisit and keep that consistency as you're working with your groups as well. All right, so next slide, please. Wonderful. So as I mentioned, we are going to kick off today with a, one, a good small group question in uh, breakout rooms. And so thank you, Jasper, for adding those instructions into the chat box as well. In your small groups, we're going to ask you to share your name, your pronouns, your organization. And the question that we're giving you all today is what is your favorite thing about fall? Or what are you looking forward to in the next few months? Before we send you off, I wanna give an opportunity for my team to just say hello, introduce themselves, answer the question if you feel like it, but just to bring um, their voices into the space. So I'm gonna pass it off to Tanayo to say hello to you. Thanks, Gina. Good morning, everybody. Um, if you weren't here on day one, my name is Tanayo Crow. I use she, her pronouns. I work as an administrative coordinator at the Community Health Training Institute, and I will be co-facilitating with Gina today. I'm really excited to be back here and see so many of your familiar faces again. Thank you for coming back. Um, and I uh, came up with this question selfishly because I love fall. So like everything about fall is my favorite. I love the weather. I love the fashion. I love the trees. Um, I love the desserts, all of it. All of it is great. So excited to hear what you all have to say about this question. Um, and I'll pass it to Jasper. Hey everyone, I'm Jasper. I use they, them pronouns. I will be your uh, tech help for today again. So if you run into any issues with audio or things not working or whatever, feel free to message me either privately or just post it in the chat. And I will, I can't promise a solution, but I will do my darndest to help. Um, and normally for this fall question, I usually answer pumpkin. I love pumpkin everything. I really firmly believe that if capitalism weren't a thing, we would have pumpkin year round. And I think that's great. <laughs> um, but I also was thinking about it and I really love layering. Like I love being able to put on like lots of different layers of clothing. So I think I have to go with, um, layering as as like the the perfect thing about fall awesome thank you jasper and tanaya i appreciate all the love of fall although i'm more of an apple person when it comes to fall flavors apple cinnamon is is my go-to jasper's like no gina sorry that's wrong <laughs> Um, so in a second, I'm going to ask Jasper to open up the breakout room so you all can get a chance to connect with others and answer your question um, about fall. But I did just want to mention our other team member, Kelly Dankert, will be joining us a little bit later in the morning. Um, so if you see her pop up, um, just know that she's also a part of our team. Um, all right. When you are ready to go, Jasper, feel free to open the rooms. There we go. Those are my people, Gina. I need to, I need to find them. <laughs> All the other fall room, lovers. Room, they're in room six. Okay, <laughs> great, great. <laughs> 
All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you all for taking some time to chat in breakout rooms about the things you love about fall. Or maybe you were chatting about something that you're looking forward to in the next few months, or maybe you were just chatting about whatever the heck you wanted to chat about. Um, so I would love to hear from a couple folks. What did you all talk about in your small groups? What came up for you? Anything fun that you wanna share with the group? You're welcome to add it to the chat box as well. Thomas, is that your hand? Or are you just flexing? <laughs> Sorry, any movement on the screen, I'm like, that person wants to talk to me. <laughs> Jill, go for it. Yeah, I'll go. Um, so we had uh, one, two, three, four, five, including me in our group. Um, what people liked about fall, I think I was the only one who, like fall is not my favorite at all. I like like hot. I like end of spring to football season ending and that's it. Um, so for me, it was football. Others, it was the fresh air, being outside, mm -hmm. um, layering and the colors. I believe I, I believe that was everything. If I left one of you guys out, I'm sorry. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Joe. I appreciate you all sharing the love of all the wonderful things of fall. Anybody else want to jump in? So many great things, according to Denial. We all love fall, Valerie said in the chat box. Anything else folks want to lift up in this space as we wake ourselves up and get ready to jump into some content? Um, my group talked about all of the uh, like autumn dessert and like winter desserts that we're looking forward to eating, uh, like different pies. And we talked about apple cider donuts. Um, and uh, just, I guess, kind of the like invigoration of activities to do mm. in the fall. And a lot of them are, you know, like community-based activities or activities that you would do with somebody. Uh, so a lot of us were looking forward to doing some of that and in turn, like spending time with loved ones uh, while we do that. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Yeah, I think other folks are feeling the same way um, in the chat box. Becky sharing fall feels like a new beginning, this nostalgic feeling of the new school year. I know um, my oldest just had homecoming this past weekend. So like all the wonderful fall things that happen. Um, and yeah, they it certainly feels like the beginning anew. Um, and I would say the only one, the one thing that like, I feel like puts it for me, puts a damper on things is that you lose daylight <laughs> and it starts to become darker a little bit earlier. Maybe that's more winter, I guess. Um, but yes, I agree with all of the lovely things that you all are sharing. Um, and yeah, thank you for taking the time to answer your question, to use your voice, to connect with others in those breakout rooms. Um, we'll get hopefully an opportunity to continue doing that throughout the day as well. Um, so why don't we get into a recap? What did we talk about on day one? Just a quick reminder. What are some things that you may have learned, picked up, or maybe you're still like thinking about, questioning about? Um, so yeah, let's get into it. So we uh, just moved down a couple of the slides that we used on day one, just to do a quick review of what it is and to remind you um, what it is that we talked about. So one of the first things that we talked about were elements of a good meeting. We asked you all, like, what was the last meeting you attended that felt like a good use of your time, that felt really productive? Um, and we heard from you all that, like, when you felt like you accomplished something, when the agenda was clear or when the goals were clear, like, what it is you were trying to accomplish, um, that was really, really helpful. Um, and it felt like a good use of your time. And so we went through all of these elements and what are things that we can incorporate within our own own groups and meetings um, to make sure that we're bringing those elements in um, and making sure that our group groups that we're working with feel like, okay, this is a good use of my time. I'm building up and connecting with others. Um, and it's clear why I'm here and what it is that we're trying to accomplish. So that's how we kind of started the day and the things that we started to think about. I'm going to ask Tanayo to take us to the next slide. And then as we started to talk a little bit about some of those elements, some of the tools that come into play when you're facilitating meetings and hybrid spaces, um, we started to talk about your facilitator toolbox, right? What are things that you can start to pack, right, within your toolbox um, to get you to feel in a place that you feel prepared and ready to have a successful hybrid 
facilitation meeting or group, right? What does that look like? What are things that you can start to consider? That's when we started talking a little bit about like content versus process. Like what are the things that we're trying to do and how are we trying to do them? What are ways that we're walking our group through some of these elements? So it feels productive, right? It feels like we're getting to our goal um, and we're using all different kinds of things to get them there. Um, so that we talked a little bit about the facilitator toolbox, and then I'm going to ask Tanayla to take us through to the next slide, where we started to think more deeply around, okay, how does this look, show, how, how does this show up in hybrid spaces, right? Um, what are some things that we need to consider? What are some questions that we need to be asking ourselves? And what are some things that we can pack you know, what's our virtual packing list look like in hybrid spaces? What are questions that we need answered before we can even think about facilitating hybrid meetings? Um, so that's, and then we wrapped up, which is, we don't have it on a slide, but we wrapped up, um, because we're gonna get into it in a second. We wrapped up the conversation really brainstorming a whole list of challenges. What are some challenges, some issues that come up um, during our facilitation experience of experiences of facilitating hybrid spaces or what do we think could be a potential challenge that come up for us so uh, before we kind of unveil some of the themes that we came up with I want to stop here in terms of the recap for day one and just hear from anyone is there anything that resonated with you from day one or are there any questions that you still have kind of floating around in your head um, from day one that that you wouldn't mind sharing with the large groups. Was there anything that kind of resonated or any questions that you still have about some of this? Yeah, go ahead, Karen. Um, I always feel like if I attend a meeting or, or a training like today and I learn at least one new thing, I feel like that is an accomplishment for me. I appreciate that. So I feel like I learned two um, important things on the training the other day. One, um, and I wrote this down. I can't remember the name of the woman who said it, but we, it's, we were talking about um, the idea of meeting in person versus hybrid versus online. A woman said, um, the social element of meeting in person is a function of privilege. And that really resonated with me. I brought that back um, to the team I work with when we were talking about what kind of meetings are we going to plan for the future? Mm. That really resonated with me. And the other thing was um, our department is that we don't have a lot of technical <laughs> capability. So when we were in meetings, um, Catherine from Wakefield said that her coalition, and she's recommending it for others, work with the local cable station. Mm. We have a great relationship with our cable station, but we never thought of doing that before. So we're going to seriously consider that going forward. So those are the two things that really resonated with me. Um, on the meeting the other day, so thank you. Awesome, thank you so much, Karen. And I still have a couple, and I have a couple people sharing um, or raising their hands, I should say. So I'm gonna ask Joanne to go first and then Thomas. Thank you. Um, I learned so much yesterday, uh, I, well, a whole list of things, but the number one concern I still have is the audio portion because I think mm -hmm. that's, that is just what's gonna trip everybody up, including me. Um, I don't feel like there's a good, a good answer to that. Although I do like the idea of the um, access television. I will try that with our access TV. I'm, I'm concerned they'll probably say no, given uh, what they've been able to do in the past for us. So it, the audio thing is outstanding for me. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. you for naming that, Joanne. I appreciate it. Uh, tonight when I were having that conversation yesterday, of like, what are some other tips, tools, and tricks that we can come up with to help people navigate those audio issues? Because yes, we are still on the struggle bus with that and trying to figure out like what what works best in, in these spaces. So I appreciate you naming that. Thank you. Uh, Thomas, go for it. Jump right in. Uh, hi, my name is Thomas. Um, the two things I learned that um, I'll be able to utilize here where I work um definitely the Ananate option. Um, up to this point, I've been screen sharing Microsoft Paint to have my own little um, <laughs> virtual whiteboard. And um, the uh, advanced audio share for sharing the PC audio rather than just hoping the sound translates well over the uh, sound bar to mm. other people's devices. Um, will definitely help out in one of the virtual meditation groups we do here. Um, it's definitely music. You don't want to sound choppy when you're trying to get in the zone. 
Thank you. Awesome. Thank you, Thomas. No, I appreciate that. Um, one of the things that I want to name too about the annotate function is that I guess with anything, not just the annotate function, but you want to prepare your audience to have the most recent version of Zoom so that they can take advantage of all of the tools that Zoom has to offer, including annotate, including breakout rooms. So um, Zoom releases updates for their platforms pretty regularly. And so just going to the Zoom website and downloading the latest version um, can be really helpful when you're trying to take advantage of all those tools. And annotate is a really fun function. We used it yesterday. Um, on a slide where folks can just type in and um, we were able to kind of screenshot all the additions. Um, but if you play around with it when you're screen, when you're the one screen sharing, Thomas, you can also just share the whiteboard. So you don't have to type up on a slide. So you it could do the same thing that you were doing with paint, um, except just having a white space for folks to draw or write or whatever it is that you want them to do creatively. So Thank you for naming that. I love that. Yes, and folks are sharing resources in the chat box, excuse me. <laughs> um, so please, yes, continue to share all those wonderful tools. Um, and one of the things that we do at the end of our trainings is we will reshare the PowerPoint in case you missed it, um, share the recordings and um, share any resources. We'll, we'll make sure to compile a list of resources that folks are either dropping in the chat box or share with us. Um, via email or anything. So be on the lookout um, some, you know, a week or so after the training and you'll get the full list of resources. So I'm gonna take a quick look at my notes here. Yes, yeah, so I think with that being said, thank you all again for, for sharing those pieces from yesterday, I appreciate it. I'm glad that you found it helpful. And I, I really, really love when folks are able to connect with others and really learn from each other in these spaces. It, um, brings me back to the days pre-COVID when, the, you know, we, could, we couldn't get groups to stop talking to each other, which we, you know, didn't want to, but um, sometimes you got to move the agenda forward, but folks are really just enjoy sharing with one another and, and sharing tips and tools that they found work for their work. So I'm loving that that's still continuing to happen and we can create the space for that to continue to happen. So with that being said, we are going to move on to the theme. So we put, took your challenges and we put them into themes. And this is what we came up with. We have five different themes that we think capture the majority of some of the challenges that you all brought up on day one. Theme number one being technology and logistics. So we hear you. We know that folks are struggling with Zoom. We know that audio and AV um, can be an issue in a lot of spaces, Wi-Fi issues, things like that. So we made that theme number one, sort of bucket number one of challenges that folks raised across all the different groups. I think there were like eight different groups yesterday. And so um, we'll have one group really tackle this theme um, and think through strategies to help or best practices that you have or resources that you might have to help address sort of some of the technology issues um, that folks identified. And we'll be doing that on Google Slides again. So that's another tool that we'll be using today during breakout room. So that's theme one. Theme two is relationship building. We saw those challenges um, come up again across all groups, really thinking about how can you build rapport in a group that's connecting via a hybrid space? What does that look like? How can you help people feel connected to one another when some people are online and some people are in person? What does that look like? Um, and then theme number three is engaging participants across platforms. How can you make activities work? How can you make people feel like they are a part of what is happening um, both in online and in person? <laughs> um, uh, theme number four is really about what are ways that we can build you up and build your toolbox as a facilitator up so that you feel ready to problem solve and adapt in the moment. So when you're having tech issues or when you're having sort of your audience is not responding to a specific activity, what are ways that you can kind of think of in your feet and like help your group move forward? What could that look like in the moment? Or what does that look like in these hybrid spaces? So that's theme number four. And then lastly, number five was the idea of accessibility. What are ways that we can be more accessible to, and tailor our sort of offerings to the group that we're working with or the community that we're trying to engage? Um, we found that across all groups as well was a, um, an important theme to bring up here. So those are our five. Um, and yeah, so just wanted to ask the group, is there, thank you so much, Cheryl, appreciate having you here. Thank you so much. Um, 
Is there anything else missing? Is there a big theme or cross-cutting theme or bucket of <laughs> challenges that you think is missing from this list um, that you were hoping we would address that doesn't fall under any of these theme areas? Can I say something? Yeah, go ahead, Jill, and then I have Natalie. Um, I feel like, I don't know if it would fit in relationship building, but what about uh, awkward, like, awkward events or events that someone says something that's like inappropriate or two people get irritated with each other like conflict what how do you deal with conflict mm. I think there's a couple of things that we can think about there I think some of the awkward stuff or where folks are are not connecting can certainly fall into that relationship building but I think when it comes to some of the other things I see that kind of falling into theme number four that problem solving oh yeah duh okay yes yeah. sorry. does mm -hmm. that make sense yeah if yes. not yeah awesome um and then Natalie am I saying your name right okay yes cool. you are thank you thank you Jan um I think you answered I think it's there already I was thinking of um adapting I'm thinking of those that are like visually impaired or you know audio impaired whatever but I think we spoke about that um last time so it's covered thank you awesome cool anyone else did I miss anyone any other have any other sort of burning thoughts or ideas that are not reflected in the themes that you see on the slide give it a second Laura, bias and stigma. Can you tell me a little bit more about what you mean? So sometimes you can see, like hear it, like in the, in the meetings and you can see that they're holding on to maybe um, older beliefs, like generational, but they're still holding on to what older beliefs. That's not, I, I don't know how else to describe it really. Mm. I just, I see it when I talk with healthcare professionals, like they're still holding on, like nurses eat their young kind of thing. Well, it's not like, it's not conducive to like a, a good environment to, to help anybody um, or to educate when people are still holding on to that kind of things and they need to be more neutral and more open-minded. I have a question for you, Laura, and I think it was Joy that was agreeing in the chat box as well. Do we think this is something that's like specific to um, hybrid spaces or is this like a general like this just comes up with my group regardless of where we are and how we're meeting the the group of individuals that I specifically work with um, I work with a, a very it's a small community but it's more older generational mm. um, so their the, the literacy in itself is a question um, mm. for understanding it and then trying to have them navigate the technology um, but then also seeing that, holding on to that generational, like not wanting to change mm. and still holding on to those older, older belief systems that are not current, not changing as it's being developed now. So I'm younger. So trying to bring in and incorporate those things is a struggle. Mm. Thank you, Laura. I appreciate that. Other thoughts? I would love to hear from folks to, to sort of ex expand this a little bit more. I want to make sure that we're able to capture it in a theme, and I would love to hear from others that are having similar issues, um, just to make sure that I have it right. Hi, it's Adriana. Um, Go for it. I, I put it in the, the chat. I, I, I feel like maybe the anything else. I know it could be under problem solving, but I think separate, it sounds like folks could use some support on like communication skills when bias and stigma enter their spaces, um, which is, I guess it's an aspect of problem solving, but it looks like a skill that, you, that folks could use some assistance on. I work in the sexual health and reproductive field. I have a lot of difficult conversations mm. and that's what it sounds like. That's what it sounds like I'm hearing because there's a lot of, and a lot of healthcare, mental health, reproductive health, 
um, disability care. There's still a lot of bias and stigma. So I think we all struggle with how to teach our content or move folks through when those feel like bias and stigma enters our spaces. I love that. I love the, the piece of having difficult conversations. I see you in there, Tanayo, um, adding the, the theme six. And so um, I'm going to ask Jasper, if you can, can you add that theme into the Google slides just to make sure um, we capture it and, and folks get a chance to be a part and do some strategy thinking around that group as well. Um, I love that. Thank you. <laughs> that was really helpful, I think, um, to, to think through um, a way that we could capture that theme that made sense so that folks were kind of really digging in um, and coming up with strategies to, to think through what that could look like for your group. All right, so we're adding theme six. So in a second, while we kind of work on the back end and getting ourselves prepared to do that, um, is that we're going to go back into breakout rooms. So similarly to day one, for those of you that were here, um, we're going to put you all into breakout rooms, and then you are going to have the Google slide brainstorm. So each group, what depending on the theme that you're assigned, so theme one will will have all the challenges that you all came up with related to theme one on one slide so you can be reminded what it was that you all came up with. And then on the, the slides below it, um, it, they're blank. So that's where you brainstorm all your strategies. So if you needed to address, you know, challenge one that's listed on your slide, um, then you're gonna come up with the whole list of strategies. So Jasper added the Google slides to the chat box. Awesome, thank you so much. And those slides start on slide, do, do, do. instructions are on slide uh, 30. And um, the slides themselves with all the themes start on slide 31. Um, so 30 are your reminder of your instructions, what it is that we're asking you to do. But in your breakout rooms, you're going to review the challenges from yesterday related to the theme that you're assigned to. And then you're going to brainstorm a list of strategies. And then when we come back, we want to hear what you all came up with, share some highlights, um, and, and then we're going to sort of move forward in the content. But does that make sense? Does anybody have any questions about what it is that we're doing at this moment? All right, so please feel free to click into the Google Slides if you haven't already, and we're going to ask some folks to to help um, take notes so that when you come back, you can share and then you'll have somebody helping lead the conversation as a facilitator, somebody note taking, and then somebody to share back when we come back to the large group. Um, and we are going to give you about 15 or so minutes in your breakout room to do this brainstorm. So Jasper, are we good to go? I know I threw in an extra element for you to take care of, but. We're all good, I pivoted. Um... <laughs> One thing I just want to ask is there's a 401 phone. Oh, never mind. The 401 phone number disappeared. I just oh, wanted no. to know someone was dialing in via audio <laughs> that you were getting sent into the right room with your audio. Otherwise, you're going to have a very disjoint experience. <laughs> but I will open up the breakout rooms now. They were randomly generated, so I have no idea who's, who's going where. <laughs> Thank you so much, Jasper. I appreciate you all for bearing with us. And yeah, so you will see the pop-up, go to your breakout rooms, make sure you click the Google link. You should be good to go. Can I ask you guys a question? Yes, you may. Um, or an idea. The people that I'm meeting in these little great, these little breakout rooms, like are amazing. And this is exciting and fun. I feel like and we mentioned it in the, this little group we just had, networking would be amazing is that is it weird if like at the end like is there a way to like make it accessible like whoever wouldn't mind being reached out with like if I say "Ooh, I want to I want to request that I'm a connection on LinkedIn with Gina like <laughs> some might be like whoa you know what I mean is there a way to do that yeah, so we, as part of our registration, we ask for permission to share your contact information, um, your email. And so as long as uh, folks have said yes, that they're okay with that, then they'll be added to, to that. Oh, so you guys are going to do that anyway? Like, 
Thank you so much. I really appreciate that. Right. So you can find someone's LinkedIn via their email or is that not true? I guess you could search for them via name. I don't know. I don't know. I just like, I'm the type of person, I say hi to everyone who walks by me. Like I'm just that person, but I know some people don't like that. Like the boundaries, like, whoa, just cause I was in the facilitating thing. I <laughs> like, are you creeping on my page? You know what I mean? So yeah. I appreciate that. Cause there's a lot of good causes that I think we could all network together. Yeah, no, completely agree. So yeah, we certainly share the, the email list, um, the list of folks, like their name, person, last name, and then their email. Thank um, you so much. That's that folks yeah. can stay connected. Yeah. As long as, um, as long as folks have given us permission to do so, then yes, we're, we're happy to share that contact information. But yes, if you do find us on LinkedIn, we're, we're happy to build, continue building our networks. Okay. Um, this is great. Thank you. <laughs> Awesome. All right. So thank you all for having those small group conversations. Um, I was uh, uh, looking along on the Google slides here. Um, so I know that there were a couple of groups that were uh, figuring out the same themes. So I think, depending on, on how you were broken up. So I would love for you all to... Um, share a little bit of some highlights. What are like some top two strategies or suggestions, solutions um, for these themes? So we're gonna start with theme one, which was logistics, technology, um, things sort of that fell under that theme. So what are some top two strategies that those of you that talk about theme one have for us? And we're gonna take notes on the slide. So anybody from theme one want to share if you talked about technology or logistics? I'm happy to share two of the um, highlights from our group. I would say that my favorite would be suggesting that participants turn off their video if they're having audio problems. Um, and then another one that was really great was knowing the needs of your participants, make every, make sure everyone is welcome wherever they are and just have like a spirit of generosity and patience when it comes to this, because it's hard to work out all of the kinks in the moment. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Devin. Is there another group that also tackled this theme that I might've missed? No. All right. Theme two. Uh, now I can't see because it's really small. Theme two was relationship building. So what are some top two strategies that you all came up with for relationship building? I know we had folks. There we go. Go ahead, Amanda. I can go. Um, so trouble connecting um, virtually um, to individual people. So trying to connect with them one-on-one -on -one in like breakout rooms or um, doing icebreakers throughout the training or the meeting, um, either in a larger group or in smaller groups so people can get to know each other like we did here. Mm. Um, have somebody who can manage like the vibe of the room, really making sure people are connected, um, engaged, things like that. And then somebody said they had the same personality and would host just the way they would in person and try to take mm -hmm. away the fact that it was on Zoom. I love that, bringing that same energy despite the platform that you're using. Um, and that's totally a role that we've had before in different meetings. So there are times where we have somebody that's on tech, somebody that's a note taker. Um, I have certainly seen a number of groups that have a vibe checker that somebody's like, hmm, feeling like the energy is really low. So we're gonna do a quick icebreaker to get people up and moving or whatever it may be, depending on what your group is. So a vibe checker, I think is an awesome role to have um, and to engage your participants in, right? Doesn't You don't need to be a facilitator or the lead of a coalition to be the vibe checker, right? If you're um, you know, a part of the group, then you can totally take on one of those roles. So I love, I love that tip there. All right. Theme number three, engagement across platforms. What are some highlights from your conversation that you talked about in the theme three group? So that was group five and six. So we had two groups talk about theme three. What are some highlights from that conversation? I can go. 
Yeah. Earlier. Um, one thing that we talked about was, so we, we were talking a little bit about um, how many hosts you should have in a meeting and understanding how many participants you should be expecting when you host meetings and mm. determine, determine that number of like support that you think you will need. Um, so again, like I think like a fair rule is if you have over 10 plus people joining a meeting, I think it's fair to say to have someone extra <laughs> to manage the chat or the corporate tech. Um, a lot of the times, what we're doing in-person meetings, there's there's usually two people in the room helping out. But um, if you have like a small team, it could be worth it, like help getting a volunteer or someone like that to, to support you. Um, it just kind of like eases your pain when it comes to you know, engaging the room and checking mm. people's emotions. Um, another thing too that we talked about is like the goal is to try to make this feel like a community, right? And virtually that's, that can be very difficult. Um, so a big thing was like checking in with everybody, even acknowledging your own emotions before the meeting starts. Cause not everything's like always peachy, you know, um, mm. it's important to let people know like you're having a tough day. Um, I work with students and I let them know that I'm not having a good day sometimes. And that doesn't mean I'm going to bring that into the space, but there's other things happening in my life, you know? So I think that's important because, I know you, we're all human, right? It's good to acknowledge that. Um, and I think the last one too is that if you are using other um, platforms, it's important to make sure your materials are easily accessible on those platforms. Um, a lot of the time someone sends a PowerPoint and you open it up on your phone and it looks like, I don't know, like a fake website. <laughs> so it's just important to, to like make sure that all that works correctly because that can really stress people out. Um, and like one of those silent stresses no one really talks about, but yeah couple things. Thank you. Thank you, Reynaldo. Yeah. Is there, I know there was another group that also talked about engagement across platforms. Is there anything that you want to add to this list that Reynaldo just shared? Anything that might not be captured in our notes? Um, sure. We talked about um, tech literacy. So if you've mm -hmm. got people on a platform they're not familiar with, uh, check in with them in advance, make sure they've got the most up-to-date version and do some basic training of what you're gonna be using at the start of the meeting. Um, and then with the supporting multiple learning styles, we talked about different ways that you can present information, written, visual, um, role play, or some sort of hands-on. And, um, inviting people who are more tactile learners to, so in-person meetings, people used to like bring toys and stuff for tactile learners. So inviting people to bring like projects that keep their hands busy to the meetings, if that's something that will help them focus better. Um, and I think we also talked about for access, being able to get those recorded sessions out mm -hmm. and sending the materials both before and after. Um, which is the added benefit of allowing people to share those materials with others at their organization if they can't attend. I love that. Thank you so much, Joy. Um, certainly alluding to one of the conversations that Tanaya had in prep for, for today's conversation is like the tech literacy piece is certainly something that you just have to take time to do, especially if you're introducing a new tool or platform to the group that you're working with. And sometimes that can happen over a period of time, right? You can't introduce a tool and say, all right, we've made this agreement and I've showed you how to do this thing. So like now I expect everyone to be able to use this thing. Sometimes it's gonna take repetition and to reteach people what it looks like um, to engage and then to prioritize um, that engagement and to, to name that like, this is how we are going to function in this space and we wanna, make room for what that could look like and make sure that we're taking the time um, to show people and to teach people so that they can take advantage of the tools that we're, we're offering. And if it doesn't work, then like, then we got to revisit, right? <laughs> like, um, we had this idea of what this tool was going to do um, and it's not working exactly how we wanted to. So how do we pivot? How do we sort of reconnect with folks? So um, thank you. I appreciate um, all the wonderful thoughts here. Um, all right, theme four, problem solving and adapting. What did you all come up with? I can share what my team came up with. So problem solving and adapting, first of all, it's just really important to have a, a good plan going in and not be flying by the seat of your pants. That was mm. the most important thing. And, and as you mentioned on Tuesday, just having like a plan B and a plan C, just thinking it through the things that could go wrong and 
and being flexible when other stuff goes wrong that you didn't even think about. Um, always nice to have a co-facilitator, but if you can't have that, we thought it might be useful to delegate certain tasks to mm -hmm. other people in the meeting. For example, I thought, you know, it's hard to pay attention to the chat box if you are in person with people. So asking somebody else to keep an eye on the chat box and just letting you know there's a chat or, you know, just being able to delegate some of those because you can't think about everything all at once. Um, sharing out materials beforehand, as people mentioned for theme mm. three. Those are the top ones. Awesome. Thank you so much, Tali. I appreciate it. Theme problem solving and adapting. Yeah. Thinking on your feet. I love that. And I think that was the only group that we had doing theme four. And as I mentioned, we're going to be saving all these slides and re-signing them out, obviously, because when we sent them out, they didn't have these on there because you just came up with them. So, um, and then you have access to the Google slides as well. Um, all right. Theme five, you all talked about accessibility. What are some highlights or some top two strategies that you all talked about? for theme five, that was group nine. I can pick someone to go, but I guess I can, I can go. Awesome. So, um, some of the things that we talked about was booking a conference room with a really big screen. So that way folks would mm. have uh, internet could have all come together to have that internet access and be able to see everything for folks in different languages simultaneous translation could be a way to do it um, like have headsets and getting to pick the language that you that you want and then the whole meeting is happening in multiple languages at the same time um, we also came up with the idea of uh, if you have multiple languages going on you can host meetings on different days like Spanish on one day English on another day uh, just to help folks feel comfortable being in their own language space and what else yeah those are probably the two big ones um, another thing that was just that like other there there are other organizations and places that offer help with tech and learning and and that there might be ways to find those resources in the in the community mm. thank you so much rex and yeah one thing i will say too is that we are going to um at, after we finish this sort of share back we are also going to share our own tips and as much as we can link resources to some of the things that you all are mentioning that we've thought about beforehand because we know that it's a challenge for folks. Um, but yeah, if there's any specific tools that you use that you want to name in this space or drop in the chat box to make sure we include, um, invite you all to do that as well and appreciate all the things naming here. Um, I think that was it for, I think we only had one theme five group. And then last but not least is our addition of theme six, um, addressing stigma and bias or communication skills, dealing with difficult conversations. Um, what kind of strategies or tips did you all come up with in your group for theme six? Uh, one thing we mentioned was um, I've seen and I've used group norms before as a way to establish this at the beginning, like have a group norm related to stigma and bias, like recognizing it, addressing it. Um, so I think it's something to ground that work. And then also it, I think it makes other people in the group more comfortable bringing it up um, if it's an issue. So it's not only on the facilitator to do that. Awesome. Is there anything else that you wanted to add or anybody else from this theme conversation wants to add anything? Um, not quite related to bias and stigma, but we also discussed having some sort of transitional phrase like, um, you know, thank you for that comment, but we're going to move on if it's not really related to what's being talked about. Mm, I love that. Thank you. We also talked about like a few different approaches if mm. there's stigma and bias 
um, coming up depending on the situation or like, you know, if it's a recurring group or not. Um, so like, I think for like, they sometimes say in schools, there's like stop it, name it, claim it, or they could say like, name it, you know, there's different orders, name it, claim it, stop it. Um, and so like in the moment, be able to address something. Um, but if it's like, you know, more subtle and it's like a reoccurring group, like maybe the best approach is a one-on-one -on -one with that person to kind of more have a deeper conversation with them about something that are playing out in the group. Um, so is it like we basically talked about how their approach might depend on the situation um, mm. and like how to tailor it depending on what might work best. Yeah, I've seen it look different ways. So stop, name it, claim it, the ouch and oops method. I think there are all different ways having those structures in place so people know when something uncomfy comes up, we have this strategy to try to address it as a group. And it's not just owned by the facilitator, right? It's owned by the group. Um, and then one thing that came up in the chat that I wanted to use as a point to kind of wrap this part up before we move into sharing some other tips um, is that Becky shared one other note about accessibility, um, including people with access limitations in the conversations about strategies and solutions. We, we don't want to have these conversations in silos, and I know we put them here in these specific themes, um, but we know that they're not just like your technology issues are going to sit on this side and then your accessibility issues are gonna sit on that side. These are all kind of interconnected um, and it's all going to depend on your group. And so this is not a conversation you should be having with yourself or just you and your co-facilitator. You should be engaging with your participants regularly because we are all trying to navigate this space and figure out what works best for each of us. So what could that look like? Um, and engaging people in that conversations, again, brings them a part of the, becoming and creating the solutions and also naming the problem. You might have an, a picture in your head of like, this is a big problem for my group, but if people are like, eh, we're okay with this, like we'll figure it out. Like maybe sound is not the best, but we're, we're okay with like dealing with not great sound. But this other thing is really something that bothers us. And maybe it's not something you've even thought of. So um, I think that's sort of just a, a great reminder for us um, as folks that are leading in spaces or co-facilitating in spaces to, to think through um, these considerations as we, as we move forward with trying to come up with solutions to the challenges that come up. Um, so you all have named a lot of really wonderful solutions and strategies and tips um, already. So I'm actually going to pass it to Tanaya to take it to take us through this um, kind of pre-selected list um, that, that we um, put together based on some other resources that we have. So I'll hand it off to Tanaya. Awesome. Thank you, Gina. Yeah, so just want to pause before I go through this and just say, one, these were amazing solutions. I'm really impressed with what you all came up with. Um, when Gina and I were brainstorming the section, we were like, oh my gosh, like, is 10 tips enough? Are we going to have enough to, to give them? But like, honestly, this is why we love to do this kind of activity, because what you all just brought takes what we had already and expands on it and makes it so much better. So um, when you're looking back through this, I think just like recognizing like all the amazing energy and ideas and thoughts that came out of this space um, is something worth keeping in mind. Like you all have the tools and the smarts to make this kind of a meeting work. So just like huge props to you all. Um, the next thing I wanted to mention is just before I go through these, you know, I think one thing that's come up a lot is this idea of preparation and something we wanted to really make sure we were saying explicitly um, and being intentional about is that all of these tips are really wonderful and these strategies are great, but part of that is, you know, taking the time to learn it yourself and then also to teach it to the people you're going to be working with. So I think, you know, as we know with any sort of new technology, whether it's Zoom, whether it's Teams, whether it's, you know, PowerPoint, whatever it is that you're using, um, it's important to take time for that training period and to get familiar with it because the more that you do something, the better you're going to get at it, right? Um, so just noting that any of these things that you're going to take with you, um, have that patience and have that grace for yourself as you learn it. And then also make sure you're giving that to other people. You know, these, thing, these things don't happen overnight. So just wanted to, to say that before we go into these strategies. So actually, um, we wanted to show you number one. So if I'm sorry to do this, but if we could switch to the Google Slides real quick. 
Um, I know some of you can open them, but some of you may not be able to. So yeah, if we could just share on slide. Let's see, there's so many now. Slide 48. So if you're following along on Google Slides, that's awesome. I think we're also going to show you on here. Um, the first strategy that hasn't been mentioned so far that we wanted to name in terms of specifically engagement in a hybrid setting is what we call the circle up tool. Um, so I think that's going to get pulled up in just a moment. But if you're looking at Google Slides, you can see a nice little circle. Um, and around it, we have little boxes that say name slash pronouns. So um, sometimes we didn't do this in this group because we had 120 of you sign up and it seemed a little bit unruly. Uh, but sometimes what we do in a smaller group, you know, maybe 20 to 30 ish people is we'll offer this tool as a part of our introductions. And so um, we'll ask people to sort of pull up a chair um, and select a box and type in their name and pronouns. And then um, the way that you run the introductions is you sort of just like go around. So maybe Gina would start up top and Gina would introduce herself. Um, and then we usually include some sort of icebreaker question. So here, I think my example was like, what's one word to describe how you're feeling today? So it can really be anything, um, but this, is, this works sort of in two ways. One is that it helps you stay organized and make sure that you're not missing anybody in the room and it kind of mirrors um, what you might do in person. So if you're sitting around a small table and you're asked to do introductions, like this is basically that, but online. Um, and it's also just a good way to make sure that people feel like they can get their, their voices in the room because maybe it's a meeting where that's the only chance they're gonna get to talk. And so we just wanna make sure that we're honoring that space and making room for people to share and to have their voices in the room. Um, and then also for a facilitator from the back end, this is a really great way to make sure you're not missing people as you go through. So if you're looking at your little circle up tool and you're like, oh my gosh, Jasper, they haven't spoken in a while. Maybe that's a cue for you as a facilitator to call on Jasper and just make sure that they're still with you. Um, so we wanted to share that. So sorry, now, now we're gonna go back to the PowerPoint. I know that's really obnoxious, but <laughs> migrate back over to the slides. Uh, so we just wanted to share that as sort of one big strategy. When, one thing that we like to use a lot, especially in our virtual space. Um, the next one, I'll let you catch up, sorry, I'll pause. Um, <laughs> It's a, look at all the pretty pictures as we fly through. Thank you, Kelly. Much appreciation. Um, <laughs> so the second tip we wanted to offer is just making sure that if you are in person, um, your group is setting up in a way that like everyone can be seen. So one way that we do this, and I think this was brought up on Tuesday as well, is that we all have um, laptops, every staff person. And so even if we are meeting in a hybrid setting, like, you know, let's say that five of us are meeting in a conference room and 10 people are joining online, those five that are in the conference room are going to have their laptops with them and they're going to join the Zoom meeting on their laptops and also have it on the conference room screen. So what that does is it puts all of the little online faces up on a big screen. And for those folks who are joining online, it allows you to see the people who are in the room up close. Because what happens is if you don't do that, um, you get the camera angle from, so I'm trying to keep my hand in the screen, you get the camera angle from the conference room video, whatever that might be, and the people at the table look really far away. Um, so this is a nice way to make sure that the folks online are still feeling engaged, still feeling like they're there in the room as much as possible. Um, so we recommend that, of course, recognizing not everyone has a laptop for every staff person. This might not be possible. So just thinking about how you can, um, you know, make sure that as much as possible, you're, you're giving that face-to-face -face interaction. Um, and I think I just want to pause and check the chat box. So can you review how participants could all write their names on the tool? Oh yeah, so uh, just like for any other piece of Google Slides, um, it's editable by everybody. So all you would have to do is just like double click into that box um, and add your name. And in fact, I invite you to try that if you want to. Um, you all have access to this Google slide deck. Uh, so all you have to do is select a little chair, a little box for yourself, double click, and then you can type in your name, pronouns, organization, whatever you want to share, really. Um, oh, oh, no, there we go. Sorry, my Zoom just like had a moment. And let's see. How do you set up audio in that situation? That's a good question. Um, Michelle, I think it really depends. It depends on your setup. So for us, we have 
like overhead speakers essentially, or like microphones that are in the room already. So that's part of our conference room setup. Something that we've done in the past um, for this project for CHGI is we invested in a little like mic speaker. So when we, we were doing just pure webinars before, we would sort of try to sit closer to that and speak directly into it. And I know that that's not perfect, but um, sometimes that's kind of the best you can do. And then I think that's sort of where um, things like closed captioning come in so that folks who maybe can't hear as well, like you want to give them that option so that they can still follow along. Just make sure I'm not missing the rest of these comments. Several people who participate on the phone are not comfortable using Google Slides, definitely. Yeah, and I think, Rex, I think a few folks earlier suggested other sort of similar shared platforms. So things like Padlet, things like Jamboard um, can be really great alternatives. Um, in theory, those are all things that can be accessed on the phone. Um, but again, this is why we wanted to say that, you know, anything that, and I think you all said this too, anything that you're doing um, that you think would be easy, let's say like in person, you want to make sure that anyone who's joining online, whether that's on a computer or on a phone, can also do those activities. So just being really thoughtful about what you're preparing for your meetings, I think, is sort of the first step to avoiding any of that. Awesome. So I'll run through the rest of these. So similar to what we saw with the Circle Up tool, we want to make sure we're tracking participation. As I mentioned, I think it's really easy uh, to get lost if you have people joining from multiple spaces. So um, even if that means like you ask one of your colleagues to kind of just like write down the names of everyone who's in the room um, and just make a check mark every time they talk, I think that can be really helpful. Um, we didn't do that in this case again because it's a very large group. So again, it depends on the size, it depends on what you're doing, but if as much as possible, if you can just try and make sure that you're not missing people, especially the folks who are online, like really having someone to monitor what's happening in the online world is really important. Um, and then, yep, yeah, so what we try to do in our trainings, and um, I'm sure you all are doing this too, is just give people different ways to participate. So if they don't want to talk, that's fine, right? Use the chat box. Um, if you want to use the annotate function so people can type right on the screen, that's a really great way too. Um, if people are really excited about talking, give them the chance to talk. So just make sure that you're giving people as many different ways to participate as you possibly can, because you never want anyone to feel excluded because that's not their learning style um, or that's not how they want to be in that space. Um, one way you can do this is seen in number five. So you can use polling, which we did on day one. We didn't do that here um, to kind of just track and make sure people are on the same page. Um, if you're on Zoom, you can also use the reactions button. So I think uh, we might have done that yesterday during the group agreement. So it was like, okay, if you agree with these, you know, put your thumbs up. You can do that in person. You can do that with your reaction. Um, you can shake your head. So just giving people different ways to kind of interact with you, I think, is really important. Um, and then inviting people to share, but also knowing that people might not want to share. So um, I think we tend to go to this strategy a little bit more when people are really quiet. This group has been pretty good. So, so thank you all for engaging in all sorts of ways. But if there's like no activity in the chat box, if no one is talking, um, if I'm constantly sitting here in my awkward silence, you know, tenting my fingers, that might be a sign to me as a facilitator to call on somebody and just say, you know, hey, Jen, like, do you have any thoughts about this question? Um, and yeah, I'll, uh, Adriana, did you want to jump in? Um, yeah, just I realized that I'm, because I'm reading in the chat, and um, I think that's, it brings up a good point, but as a facilitator, it's also a good practice for accessibility not just for someone with a weak um, internet, but mm -hmm. um, someone who is visually impaired, a practice is to read what is on the slides. I have a picture up, it's a cute dog with a purple hat on, and right next to it, it says, whatever it says, it's actually a really good practice, again, for folks who might be visually impaired, but it also would really help like those people who are on a landline. Um, and and I, I hear everyone, and I, I just keep hearing in my head, that when we do this work, we really have to embrace the inevitably imperfectness that is this work. And when you can kind of just breathe and just be like, I'm going to plan this pretty picnic, but I cannot predict the weather, um, you do your best. And, and when you're transparent with the people in the room, I think everyone is human and breathes and go, moves along with you. 
Absolutely. Um, I could not have said that any better. So thank you so much for saying that, for naming that. Um, I really appreciated you also explicitly saying that, you know, reading something that's on the slides is a best practice. And so um, I encourage you all to do that as well. It sounds like many of you are. Um, and you're right. I mean, we're not, no one is perfect, right? I, I like to pretend that I am. I joke about that to my mom all the time. And she's like, oh, okay, okay, Tenayo. Um, but we all make mistakes, like things don't go perfectly to plan. And I think just what you were bringing, just even in the tone of your voice, like having that grace, having that patience, recognizing that things are maybe going to be imperfect is really important, um, particularly for this type of hybrid space when maybe we don't all have the answers, right? Um, so thank you. And I don't wanna hold us off from our break. So I'm just gonna run through these last few real quick. Um, so number seven, uh, we encourage you to share any visuals, any documents, anything that's going to be read um, or looked at in a meeting solely online. I think someone I saw in the notes said, you know, share a PDF of it. So whatever format works best, um, that's better than, you know, expecting that they're going to be able to read something that you post up in a room that's really far away. Like that's not helpful, right? Uh, make sure that you're including small groups for folks like myself who participate a lot more happily in a small setting. Um, and make sure that you're including breaks. You know, people have lives and needs and they need to go do things. And so building that into your meeting is really important. Um, being directive, especially in a hybrid space, is especially important because I think if you're in like an in-person space, it's a little easier to kind of look at body language and see like, okay, you know, so-and-so maybe looks like they don't want to talk. Um, but if you're online, if you're, you know, facilitating online, or in person for a hybrid meeting, it's really important to be super clear and super directive about not only like what is happening, but what you want out of folks, because I think it's really easy to kind of get lost when you're moving between different spaces. Um, and then as we all, you know, we all kind of recognize this number 10, it's not always possible to have the co-facilitator. It's not always possible to have a tech person. We totally recognize that staff capacity is real and many of you may not be able to do this. Um, but if possible, if you can, it's really wonderful to have a co-facilitator, to have a tech person, to maybe have a vibe checker like you all mentioned, maybe have a note taker. And I can't remember who said it, um, so I'm going to borrow this from that person, but um, someone mentioned if you don't have that capacity on staff, like use the people in the room. I think people are always more than happy to help out, right? Like if I went to a meeting um, and it wasn't somewhere I worked, but they were like, oh, we really need a note taker. I'd be like, sure, I can take notes, right? So, so I think there are always gonna be people who are willing to help you out in that space. Um, and I just wanna mention that I, I am reiterating a lot of these strategies from Training for Change. They're a really wonderful organization. Um, I've been to some of their trainings. They're really great, wanna promote them. So we included this uh, link in our resources slide as well. So feel free to go check them out, see what they have to offer, um, but wanna give credit where credit is due because we did not come up with all of these on our own. Um, so I'm gonna pause and see if there's any questions, gonna check the chat box, give you all a minute to respond if you have anything you would like to add. Okay, awesome. Uh, so I think with that, we're gonna move into our break, give you a 10 minute chance to stretch, um, go get some water, go get some food. I believe Jasper is gonna pull up a timer like they did yesterday. Um, but yeah, feel free to turn off your cameras, move away from the screen, go take your break, stretch out, and we'll be back in 10 minutes. I hit my stop video for a second. I don't know how that happened, but I mean, <laughs> uh, let's see. I think we're waiting for a couple more groups to wrap up. We've got about 15 seconds. and officially kicked out.
All right, welcome back everyone. Thank you so much for taking the time to do your role plays. Um, and then in order to do um, our report back just a little bit differently this time around, I want those of you that did, um, no worries, Abby, thank you so much. Um, for those of you that are leaving early, just know you'll get emailed the feedback form. So we'll be happy to hear from you that way. Thank you. Um, for those of you that tried on sort of either the being the in-person in person or online facilitator, I want you to type into the chat box, just let me know what did that feel like to be the, the facilitator in that role play? What came up for you? Was it fine? Was it nerve wracking? Was it a little bit weird? <laughs> what kind of feelings came up for you as you were taking on that role? And I'm gonna ask you to drop them into the chat box. Um, Adriana says, I love role plays. I love people who love role plays. <laughs> Thank you. Um, awesome. Jen says, a bit nerve wracking because we didn't have time to plan ahead. No, we threw you right in the fire there. Just like, go, go, go. <laughs> Try it on and see how it goes. Um, a little bit awkward. I totally get that. Looks like other folks are enjoying it as well. Yeah, having to think on your feet. Definitely. I'm glad you got to practice that, what that feeling looked like and, and felt like um, in your body, right? Um, as a co-facilitator, I found it necessary to really concentrate and focus on fellow Zoomers. Yeah. So it like forces you to pay attention. Sorry, I'm going to lean down and grab my computer charger so you all don't lose me as I'm facilitating. That would not be fun. Um, anything else? Any other feelings or things that came up for you? Um, as a co as a facilitator, either in person or online. Thank you all for sharing that. Um, participants, for those of you that were sort of like dealing with the problem, what did that feel like to to be on that end, the receiving end of folks' role playing? Um, even though you were role playing yourself too, but what did it feel like to be a participant in that space? and drop those into the chat box as well. And I'll read them out loud for you. Just as it's funny, but in real life, it would be super annoying. Yeah, totally get it when you're like waiting around for folks to figure themselves out. Good for perspective. I like that, I like that take, yeah to really get a sense of what it's like. I could empathize for our facilitator when things went wrong. Yeah, totally. Impressed with how it was handled. Nice. Becky, tell me more. What, how was it handled? What, what really impressed you? <laughs> yeah, so, um, you know, the uh, Sabeta really, sorry to put you on the spot, um, thought on their feet, uh, like they said in the chat. Um, and had thought of things that I just wasn't even thinking as a participant. I was thinking, oh, what would I be doing now if, if I were the um, the facilitator? And I was like, oh, I didn't even think of that. That was great. <laughs> I love that. One of my favorite things about um, taking on a new project or being put on a new team here at our organization, at least, is being exposed to the way other people handle problems, right? To the way other people facilitate. That's how I learn best is like seeing it and doing it in the moment. And when I'm able to like be in the presence of other folks and, and experience sort of how they would handle, yeah, totally a learning experience. I love that, that part of my job. So thank you. All right. Is there anything um, and I invite you all, so for this last part, I invite you all to share out loud now. So instead of typing it in the chat box, um, for those of you, either participants or facilitators, is there anything that you were like, oh, this like worked really well? Um, and thank you, Becky, for starting off that conversation. Or like, I noticed this thing that was like, yes, like this is a pin. I'm keeping this like for my next time. Or for those of you that were, um, facilitating, is there anything you might have done differently? You're like, I didn't have time to prep, but in a real situation, I might do this instead. So two things here. What worked really well? What's like your thing that you're like, yes, I'm keeping this um, in my brain for next time? Or sort of what is something you might have handled or done 
differently? So those are the two questions and invite folks to share out loud. Thank you, Tanayo, for adding that in the chat. Any burning things coming to mind? Go ahead, Becky. <laughs> Sorry, I realized I just talked, um, but something that came up was the idea of really take giving the facilitator time to think and regroup. Um, we, we talked a lot about how it feels like when you're facilitating, you it's nonstop, you can't stop, you just have to keep going. And mm. so, um, you know, giving ourselves the, the chance to put people in those breakout groups or um, somebody mentioned like, pose a question to the group and ask them to discuss it while you, you know, figure out whatever you need to figure out. Um, yeah, recognizing that that's okay to do. Yeah, to remember to do it. Exactly. And then quick note about Zoom, in case you were wondering, you can't go into a breakout from a breakout. So that's a limitation I recognize within the, the structure that you were in. Um, so just keeping that in mind for, for future reference. Um, go ahead, Joanne. I see you have your hand raised. Thank you. I just had to run and get my charger too, as a matter of fact. <laughs> um, so in our group, uh, Adriana, it was the uh, facilitator and I was the obnoxious person um, <laughs> interrupting all the time. And she was amazing. And uh, I learned a lot from that, the, that few minutes watching her and listening to her. Um, she remained calm and cool mm. and incredibly sweet and polite and firm at the same time. So she just kept reminding me that, you know, very nicely how much she appreciated me participating and, but she also wanted to hear other people and, um, and then she did mute me. <laughs> she, she forgot she couldn't mute me because I was actually in the room. <laughs> she said, I love that. Oh my gosh, that is hilarious. She was great. Um. <laughs> She should, she should run a session on how, on how to facilitate a meeting. It was good. <laughs> Share you. your expertise, Adriana. So something to, to, to put a notch in your cap for <laughs> if you've not done it before. <laughs> um, the other thing that I wanted to name too is about the, the muting, um, Joanne. And I don't know if we said it at the top. I don't think we did at the top of ours is that oftentimes um, when we're doing large trainings or large meetings in an effort to like make it as smooth as possible, we will tell people like if a host mutes you, like don't take it personally. It's more just about making sure that the meeting is running smoothly and folks can hear what is being shared and less about like I'm controlling and muting whoever <laughs> I don't want to hear. Um, just as a, an agreement or a way that you're sort of setting up, setting up the room for folks um, that are in the online space, but definitely something to keep in mind because it, you know, we're people and so things happen People feel a certain way about things. So like paying attention to all those dynamics that come into play um, as well. So I wanna thank you all for sharing. Um, I appreciate you trying on those facilitator and participant roles and really getting into it. It sounds like they went really well. So I appreciate you all taking the time to do that. Um, and I'm gonna pass it over to Chanayo who's gonna take us through like, why do we do these things? Why do we think it's important? Yes, thank you, Gina. Yeah, so I think you all named a lot of what we're getting at here, right? It was uncomfortable. It was awkward. You had to kind of think on your feet. You had to be flexible. And that's really what the point of this was. Like, we didn't give you prep time for a reason, right? We wanted you just to, to go with it and see what happened. Um, and obviously, this is a practice place to do that. So hopefully, when you get to that real situation, it feels a lot easier to go, okay, I've, I've been in this situation before. Like, here's something I did. And here's how it worked. So just to kind of reiterate, right, things go wrong. So having that plan B or C, having that flexibility, being able to manage in the moment. Um, and hybrid meetings in particular, we found really demand us to be flexible. And part of building that skill of facilitation is learning how to think on your feet without getting super flustered, right? Even if you're internally screaming, you need to still be in front of the room. You need to still be managing. Um, you need to still kind of keep things moving, I think Becky said, right? Things have to keep going. 
Um, you can't just stop because things kind of went off the rails or aren't going to plan. Um, so hopefully this helped you kind of recognize that um, if you weren't already thinking about it. Um, and again, really with anything, practice makes perfect. So the more that we can put ourselves in these maybe uncomfortable or awkward situations, the better we're gonna get at handling it, right? Um, and as Gina mentioned, I'm the same way. I like to observe people and that sounds kind of creepy, but I like to observe people. I like to see what they do. I like to see how they manage things because sometimes I think we kind of get into our own heads and maybe we freeze. Um, we start stuttering, we're not sure what to do next. So, so part of learning that skill, part of building that skill is really observing what other people do um, and taking, picking and choosing what, what you think might work for you as well. Um, and then also like forgiving yourself, right? Um, if things don't go super well in one meeting, that doesn't mean they're gonna go wrong in the next meeting, right? So just taking that, that um, <laughs> taking that um, learning from your, your past and applying it into future situations. And I wanna acknowledge the chat box, practice makes progress, borrowed from my yoga teacher. Absolutely. Um, and I've also heard before, not practice makes perfect, but practice makes permanent, right? So it's, it's building muscle memory. It's building, I guess, facilitation memory for lack of a better term, right? So even if this felt uncomfortable, even if it was awkward, even if you were like, this is the literal last thing I wanna be doing right now, Hopefully, at the very least, you saw something that you can take away and go, okay, I'm going to use this next time. I'm going to think about this next time. So that's really why we wanted to do this. Um, so I appreciate you all taking that leap um, and just going for it. It sounds like it was, it was a, good, a good practice for you all. Um, and just to sort of wrap up this section, I think we wanted to share some resources at this point. Gina, is that right? Yeah. Yes, we did. But one thing I wanted to name too, which we sure. do tonight, but we didn't add it to the the like why we do this. Um, but I think it's important is that Tanaya and I, after that first session, sat yesterday, not only coming up with themes, but we gave each other feedback, like what worked really well on day one in terms of our sort of co-facilitating relationship. What are some things that we noticed? What are some things we could have done differently? Um, and it's a wonderful practice to have with your co-facilitator on a consistent basis. I've been facilitating since I was 18 years old. It's a really long time. I'm not going to say how old I am. But <laughs> <laughs> um, and I still get nervous and I still practice in the mirror and I still sort of try to pay attention to what it is that I'm noticing as I'm facilitating um, and have that relationship with my um, co-facilitator. So just wanted to name that as well. And if you're not facilitating with anyone even just asking yourself some of the questions that I asked you all when you came back like what did you notice what worked well what would I do differently next time because I noticed that the situation didn't work as well as I thought it would or maybe it worked really well and you're like I'm going to do that again um, so yeah just wanted to name that um, as something that we that we often do that sort of helps when you're sort of trying to figure out what works for you yeah absolutely we'll echo that I'm a much newer facilitator so it as uncomfortable as it can be to ask for feedback, it's a really important thing to do if you want to get better, right? Like, I'm not perfect. I have a lot of things I can learn, a lot of growth. Um, and so one thing I encourage you all to do, no matter how long you've been facilitating, is ask for that feedback, right? Um, so thank you for naming that, Gina. And we just wanted to take a moment and just share some of these resources that we had come up with ahead of time and also some things that you all have been sharing. I've been trying to follow along in the chat. If I missed anything and you're like, I really want this on the slide, please feel free to add it to the chat now. And I will make sure it gets on the slide, but just wanted to call out a few things. So Training for Change, we mentioned earlier, has a really great page on hybrid facilitation and their overall website is awesome. Um, we did do a training similar to this last year, but it was geared more towards uh, solely online facilitation. If you're curious, you can check that out. Um, MAPC is doing a whole series on hybrid engagement. I've been taking those trainings. Those have been really helpful for my own learning. I think there are two in with two to go. So I'd encourage you to check those out if you're curious and you want a little bit more in this sphere. Um, some of the things, the tools we mentioned throughout, um, noting that these only work on like a smartphone or a laptop, but they can be really helpful tools. So Jamboard, Google Slides, Google Docs. Um, I think Padlet was mentioned as well along the way. Those are all really great ways to kind of like mirror what you might do with flip chart paper or scratch paper in a room. Um, we did include a couple of low budget and then more high budget speakers and mics. Again, with the caveat, like none of these are going to be perfect. These are just suggestions and maybe they will help you find something better. Um, so please don't take this as like, we're saying this is what you have to have. Like this is just to get you going. 
Um, and then just to name, you know, Zoom, WebEx, Microsoft Teams are all either free or low cost online platform options for y'all to meet on. Um, and then just to try and make sure we were addressing the accessibility piece, um, Zoom does not have the greatest uh, closed captioning on their own, but you can pay for Rev and it's pretty affordable to my knowledge. Um, and basically just like, it's like an add-in. So you go online and you like, I linked it to the instructions, so I'm not gonna get it exactly right, but you can check those out. Um, but essentially you can, you can pay Rev to do the closed captioning for Zoom as like an add-on. Um, and those tend to be a lot more accurate. So we recommend that. Um, we've used a Report International for live translation before, and then the Massachusetts Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing does offer really great options uh, for ASL and other um, uh, accessibility options for those who are hard of hearing. And then I added in at the bottom the local cable access TV stations. If you don't have the in-house tech support, that was a great suggestion. So thank you to Catherine, I think, who suggested that. Um, but again, if I missed any resources that you want added, feel free to throw those in too. I see, yep, mural and whiteboard, awesome. But we just wanted to make sure to name that um, before we move into our close. Give you a chance to share anything else that we missed. Awesome. So I think with that, we're going to head into our close. So we have a few things we wanted to share with you, but I think I'm going to pass it to Kelly to wrap this up. Let's see if I can find her. There she is. <laughs> Um, sorry, I've been alternating between sitting and standing just to make sure my body stays young and mobile. <laughs> um, but I want to share our upcoming trainings around, um, we have one coming up in October 26th, which is Building Trust for Decision Making. And so we'll be talking a little bit more about our process tools and how we can really build tr um, trust in our communities by tapping into our process tools and being more um, participatory and making sure that we're getting more um, thoughts into like the decision making spaces. So it's good for a lot of uh, meeting leaders and coalition leaders, but also just members who want to continue to build their toolbox around making decisions. So I'll be leading that along with Jamia Tappan, who some of you may be familiar with. She works a lot um, on like housing justice work in Boston. Um, works at the Boston Children's Hospital and also Boston Medical Center as well. So registration is live and I think someone is popping that link into the chat box along with also um, popping in the feedback form as well. We really care a lot about these trainings and how it lands with you all and how we do activities and we listen to your feedback and we incorporate it and we just work to make sure to that um, we are incorporating all of your feedback that these trainings are relevant and that they work for you all. And this could be anywhere from the activities that we lead, the format, um, the length of trainings, even like the time of day that they're at. So no feedback is off the table. We really appreciate everything that you have to say about that. So we'll give you a couple of minutes to fill that out before we close the meeting. Um, and we just encourage you to stay involved with CHTI. So, you know, visit us on our new website, follow us on Twitter. We have a LinkedIn community group as well. Um, and also email any and all of us. I think on this next slide, uh, you can email Gina and Tanayo at these email addresses here. And then also uh, feel free to connect with each other to make sure that you are DMing the people that you want to DM for their LinkedIn information, getting their email addresses, and really just building that network. And I think I'll pass it back to Gina and tonight. I don't do anything else to close out um, before, well, while you're filling out your feedback form. Thank you. Yeah, so if you have a few minutes now, we encourage you all to please fill out the feedback form. It should only take a few minutes. I don't think they're, they're too, too long. It just depends on how much you want to write in there. Um, but yeah, just want to extend a huge thank you um, to all of you for, for sticking with us for these two days or one day, depending on. I think a lot of people are returners. I don't, I'm curious to see <laughs> how many folks uh, made it just a day two. But um, it's been a pleasure and I love how engaged you all are. And I, you know, can't wait to continue the conversation and hopefully see you all at our next training. I'll leave it to Tanaya to share any closing words as well. 
Sure, I'll keep it short and sweet. Just thank you all so much for coming, for participating, for bringing your energy and ideas. And honestly, like y'all got this. You're gonna do great. You're gonna have great meetings, great hybrid events. You have the tools you need and I'm really excited to, to see how that goes for you. So thank you. Awesome. So yep. Yeah. So as you fill out the feedback form, I'm going to fill the silence a little bit here. If you're shooting out, please feel free to unmute yourself and say goodbye. Um, and, and yes, thank you. Please. All of you have been amazing. Um, that's, that's all we've got. That's all folks. <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you.